Hey, fantastic. Guys, we welcome you to uh, this May market update today. My name's Rich Brady. I'll be presenting from the Oxford Wealth team. Uh, being a Memorial Day weekend, we're kind of running short on staff. A number of us are on vacation. Hopefully, we've, we've got enough bodies here to, to pull this off. Um, anyway, happy Memorial Day to everybody. We're going to be talking about several topics today. Uh, let me see if I can pull this up. There we go. So we're going to give the May market update. We're going to talk about real estate and investing options in real estate. There's different alternatives, some different things you want to consider as you uh, consider putting money uh, into real estate. And then I'm going to specifically dive a little deeper into a self-directed Roth IRA where you can nest real estate into that type of uh, in a, a, a retirement investment. And uh, it's got some advantages and some disadvantages. So well, why don't we go ahead and get started? So as far as the market is concerned, man, has it been crazy over the last month? Uh, there's no doubt about it. Inflation is absolutely the story of the day. Now, keep in mind, Gage last time uh, we presented in April talked uh, a little bit about the fact that inflation really does not impact the stocks very much from the standpoint of uh, you know, all, all businesses do, if they really find themselves in an inflated period related to pricing, they just raise their prices. And us as consumers, we pay for it. Uh, the big story, though, is that the Fed needs to control inflation. How do they do it? They do it through raising interest rates. So there is no question the Fed has really telegraphed where they're heading with this. They're going to raise rates for the rest of the year. The question is, is how aggressive are they going to raise those rates? Is it, is it going to be, uh, you know, 100 basis points or one percentage increase each time this year? Will it be 50 basis points? Well, so far year to date, they've raised it 25 basis points. And then last, about two weeks ago, they raised it 50 basis points. Things that I'm hearing is that they are, as long as they can keep a recession from occurring, they're going to press the envelope and keep raising rates. So what does that mean for all of us? Well, your CD rates and your banks will go up. Uh, if you're looking to buy a mortgage, likely those rates will go up. So from a cost of money, it's not necessarily a good thing. The market certainly don't like that. That impacts the cost in which businesses can borrow money from banks. And uh, that is why uh, really the markets do not like rising interest rates. The other factor is uh, that they're trying to balance, of course, is while they're raising rates, not to negatively or significantly adverse the economy, to, to shrink uh, the growth of the economy. Now, we know that in the first quarter, GDP was down 3.1.4%. Uh, so it contracted in the first quarter. You know, uh, CEOs, I saw a study the other day that CEOs, about 60% of them believe that we are in a recession. They believe that the market is not as healthy, uh, or rather that their business is not as healthy today as it was in the first quarter, early in the first quarter. So uh, there are some warning signs that we are perhaps are in the early stages of a recession. Let's hope that's not the case. We know that the, that the yield curve inverted. We talk at great length about that in our workshops and dinner events. So we've got to watch that closely. So it's a balancing act, raising rates, and hopefully not too aggressively negatively impacting the, uh, uh, the economy. We also know, though, that the impact has been uh, the markets are, they don't like uncertainty, specifically with interest rates and where we're heading in the next 12 months. So they have negatively received the news of rising rates, and to a large degree, we're in a bear market now. So... The market fundamentals, though, are not all gloomy. Uh, kind of want to throw out there a couple of important talking points here. People are holding on to a lot of cash. That is significantly different than where we were in 2008 when we had our significant market uh, uh, correction in 2008. Um, I read this morning, $2.3 trillion are sitting in what is called excess household savings. Although consumers are... Uh, saving less. In fact, I read this morning, the average consumer is saving about 4% of their income. That's significantly lower than where we've been in the past. But 
we're sitting on a lot of cash as, a, as an economy here in the States. So uh, it's not all bad news, uh, saving less, but spending continues. Uh, jobs, uh, unemployment rates remain uh, fairly favorable at 3.6%. So people are employed, they're spending money, uh, and they have cash on hand. So that is good for an, for an economy. Um, also, corporate uh, earnings have been up this last quarter to the tune of 16% per, uh, in the S&P, and then earnings are up as well. Okay, so inflation is going to be here a while. Let's talk a little bit more about it and do a little deeper dive. CPI, 8.3% in April. Not good. If you've gone to the store to buy a loaf of bread, you know that. Inflation outpace, is outpacing wages. Uh, wages are up about 5%. With an 8% cost of goods increase, uh, are, you know, we're falling behind. And anybody on a fixed income absolutely knows that. Um, I did want to highlight, certainly energy is leading the way. $6 for a gallon of gas. Man, it's been years since we had that. But that's what they're forecasting in August for the United States. $6. So you may want to plan accordingly. Now, one little piece of bright news related to inflation. It is growing, but at a declining rate. So they're uh, just this morning, the reason the markets are up is because there are price pressures the price pressures in the economy appear to be easing. Now that is for non-energy, non-food items. And so uh, it was viewed as a positive. The leading indicator that the government looks at uh, was right in line with what they expected at 4.9% for again, non-energy, non-food. So it is viewed as a good sign. The market saw that and said, that's fantastic. Some of the the actions that the Fed has taken are working. And so the markets responded favorably today. Um, so what are your options? With market volatility, uh, one of the things I wanted to highlight is that you're gonna, over the coming weeks and months, you're gonna begin to see different analysts take different perspectives related to the impact of the economy and what I was sharing on the markets. I've seen, Different large broker, brokerage houses say now's the time to buy stock. Others have maybe held stock in a neutral position. Others are saying don't, don't touch the markets yet. So the point is there's a contrarian view out there amongst the analysts as to where whether now is a good time to get back in. I wanted to offer you just three alternatives to consider related to if you're one of those that has a significant amount of cash, you maybe sold some stock, you're sitting on the sidelines in cash, perhaps you sold a real estate property, you're sitting in cash. If you're one of those folks, just know you've got some options. Now, one of the things that we share in our firm is that we'll tell folks your option is if we don't know where the bottom is, one strategy is to do what is called dollar cost average, which is where you take a systematic approach to putting in a fixed amount over a fixed, over a given period of time. So say, let me give you an example. Every couple of weeks, you put $1,000 back into the market. What does that do? Well, most people fail in their attempt to try to time the market. And instead of putting all of your assets into the market, if there's gonna be further deterioration in the markets, do it over a period of time. And statistically, that will give you a better return than if you try or attempt to time the market. I also wanted to put out there a couple of alternatives that you can take as far as short-term investments in what are called TIPS or Treasury Inflation Protected Securities. Those are basically securities issued by the federal government that are indexed to inflation. Now you've got to watch it. It's, it's really deemed as a short-term investment. So while inflation is really deemed as uncertain, Keep in mind that uh, there are government securities that are indexed to inflation, TIPS. Uh, the last one I wanted to mention is that if you have money sitting in a, what we call a bank alternative, you're sitting there and you don't like the 2% or the 1% or less that you're getting with your bank, you do have alternatives known as multi-year guaranteed accounts. Uh, we The rates were increased this, this week. And, and uh, uh, if you're looking for a two-year return, you can get about 2.85% on that money, guaranteed safe positions. You also have the opportunity of putting money into a three-year position. And uh, uh, the leading carrier for that right now is offering 4%. So 
That's one of the good news with rising rates is that fixed rate investments are on the rise as well to compensate for that. Okay, I wanted to share just a thought or two um, related to real estate trends. Okay, since we are talking about real estate, I wanted to hit a couple of points. So raw material costs, right, remain very high for the builders uh, that are building new homes out there. Now, there are several things that have happened, though, with rising rates and inflated home prices. We're actually, actually seeing new, oh, I'm sorry, new home sales are decreasing. And with, they've actually gone back to the same rate as they were in uh, 2008. So housing inventory, highest it's been since 08, and new sales are decreasing. Now, of course, they basically all, whenever you talk about real estate, folks are always mentioning uh, that most of the time, real estate trends are really a local condition. It's a local market, not necessarily a national market. That can be true. Right now, we are still seeing some national trends uh, that are taking place. Um, I wanted to mention, though, that uh, I, I have clients of mine that will come in the office and they'll say, Rich, are we in a housing bust? Are we going to have a bubble that's going to burst anytime soon? It depends where you live and the impact, but I don't think so. I think the bottom line is, is again, that uh, uh, people will, um, there will be a cooling effect. I think that's common. And I think that's something that we should expect, maybe a five, 10, maybe a 15% reduction, but I don't see the fundamentals in the economy uh, are going to let, uh, um, are, are going to basically generate a, uh, uh, a housing a housing bust that could possibly happen. I just don't see that happen. So real estate, let's talk about real estate for a second. So as a part of an investment strategy, real estate is a good option. It can diversify your risk and it can produce some results that are satisfying, right? You have the ability to invest in a investment that is not tied to the, mark, to the stock market. And so it's uncorrelated. We talk at great length about that. You want investments in your portfolio that are diversified, but are also uncorrelated. While one is rising, the other could be down and vice versa. We often mention stock and gold or commodities. They act inversely. Real estate is, is, uh, is one of those that can act in an uncorrelated way to your stock holdings. It's also a, dif a, a distinct asset class. And lastly, one of the benefits of real estate is that you can generate income on a monthly basis, quarterly or annual basis, but you also can take advantage of cap gains in that property. And so that is something you wanna consider. Another clarifying point I wanted to make, you can directly invest in owning and managing properties yourself, or you can indirectly uh, be involved in real estate through different kinds of trusts and investments. And we're gonna talk about both of those. Um, so there's five simple ways and five simple tools that you can, that you can take uh, to get exposed in your portfolio to real estate. And we're gonna talk about these different five strategies, rental properties, buying rentals, uh, house flipping, uh, real estate investment groups, real estate investment trusts, and then what is called crowdfunding. We're gonna talk about that a little bit more. So rental properties, uh, for those, that one of the attributes with rental properties, you really have to be comfortable that you're a do-it-yourselfer. You gotta be comfortable in maintaining and repairing the homes. If not, you, you pay a property manager and then that can eat into your profits. You've got to be patient as you, uh, for anybody out there that has rental properties, you know this, uh, you got to be patient with your tenants. Sometimes they'll come across hard times, they can't make their payments, and uh, that can pose some hardship for you as the property owner. Uh, the other one is that it requires capital, right? A significant amount of capital, but you can, uh, and that is to maintain uh, the property. Sometimes, uh, you know, if you have a plumbing or a, um, an irrigation repair or some, uh, you know, a roof that needs to be replaced, that can be a significant hit to your, to your finances. So some of the pros, right, is that appreciation, rental income, but also capital appreciation. Uh, the big advantage with owning your own uh, investment properties and renting them out is really around leverage. You can leverage a small amount of money 
you can borrow. And especially if you're in a market that is appreciating, it can be a nice return for you. So it's all about leverage on the rental side. Uh, there's a lot of tax deductible uh, uh, benefits related to rental properties as well. On the downside, we mentioned tenants. Uh, there's potential to damage to your property. And then lastly, uh, vacancies, which then you bear the brunt of that by owning directly in a, in a rental property. Second one I wanted to mention around direct is house flipping. This one's a bit more speculative and a bit riskier, is that you can repair and update a property. You can buy one with the intent to, you know, if you're in a market of late, we saw a lot of people running out and buying properties. I live in the Austin area and we've seen significant price increases, especially with a lot of new employers moving into the area. What's happened is it's really just caused this huge amount of demand and not as, you know, uh, supply is just not there. In fact, this morning I read that there's about a two week inventory right now. It still remains very, very tight here in the Austin market. So you could buy a rental with the, with the intention and the hope that it will increase in value. You can complete the work yourself. That's the key here is speed. You wanna get in, you wanna get out and you wanna flip the house. The next one is literally if there's no repairs that need to happen, you just go in, you buy the property, you hold it for a short period of time and then sell it as quickly as you can. So the key here with house flipping is you've got to have capital, but um, you've got to make sure that it's all about timing. And if you don't time it right, you can be uh, exposed to a significant uh, uh, a loss in your account. Uh, that could occur if, you, if the market's cool and uh, you've got to have some deep market understanding and knowledge. Usually my experience has been with those that are in this kind of a market is that they have deep understanding. They are real estate agents, real estate developers. They get in, they get out, they know the market, and this is what they do for a living. I personally think it's it's difficult for someone that's a casual uh, observer or just investor to really do this and do it well. Those that are in the market seem to, to do better. Now, to those that are what we would call indirect. What does that kind of mean? This one's a little bit of a hybrid. Real estate investment groups. This is where you own real estate without the management hassles. You inv your investing requires a capital cushion and access to financing. A, a, an investment group, a real estate investment group is like a small mutual fund that invests in rental properties, okay? So how does this work? What's an example? Well, say you join a group that allows for individual investors to buy one, one or more units that's uh, say owned by ABC company. ABC company then will manage the units. They'll handle the maintenance, they'll handle vacancies, they'll interview all candidates. So they do all the operational work while you own the lease, you own the property. But as a result of them supporting the maintenance, and uh, for their effort, they will then take a percentage of the income that is generated from your ownership. So uh, as a common practice as well, it's uh, you as an investor will pull your resources with other investors. And uh, you do that for the simple fact of trying to, as a collective group, minimize the risk that you would have related to vacancies, okay? Um, and uh, so, so that's kind of how it works. Think of it as a small mutual fund investing in rental properties. You own the asset, uh, but the investment group then collects that percentage. So it's more of kind of a hands-off approach. It allows you to own without the hassles. Um, it provides income and appreciation since you're the owner. Uh, but then what's the biggest risk? Well, it's the vacancies. You've got to manage that well. Uh, you may also have what I called unscrupulous managers that may take advantage of you. So you need to be cautious in who you choose to associate yourself with and choose to go in business with. Um, let's now shift to a REIT. Uh, think of a REIT as a more formal version of a real estate investment group. Uh, this is an entity that will take investor money and they will purchase and they will operate the properties. Think of it as they bear more risk, but they then uh, you then have the ability on an exchange 
to trade that asset back and forth. And so REITs, if they are public and if they are traded, uh, are quite liquid, which is a big advantage, uh, advantage to some folks that want real estate um, exposure, but yet they don't want some of uh, or most of their capital tied up in such a large investment. You also have the ability to um, get into these types of investments uh, outside of the residential market. So in other words, they will invest in commercial properties, uh, duplexes, apartment complexes, residential units. And so you have exposure to a lot broader market, but you are doing so by, if you will, taking advantage of uh, or treating it more as a dividend or uh, like a dividend paying stock is how you would look at this kind of an investment. Um, one thing I wanted to highlight here is that you need to know what kind of REIT you are getting into. I have clients that have purchased uh, non-publicly traded REITs that were illiquid, and they got in being sold that they were going to earn 8 to 10% return on the investment. Now that they are retired and they are four or five years into this REIT, they cannot get out. And uh, so then we have to go through the whole redemption process, and that can be a very slow, painful process uh, to try to get access to your cash again. So think of this as, yes, they are publicly traded, but if they're not, um, if, if the, sorry, if the REIT is publicly traded, then you can get access to your cash. But if it is not, and it's private or not listed, then you are at the expense uh, of the terms found within the agreement. So make sure you read the, uh, the terms very, very carefully. I wanted to mention uh, a, a last one known as online real estate platform or crowdfunding. This is an interesting one. Um, I, I don't have a lot of experience with this one, but I wanted to make sure that you were aware of it if you, if you are interested in real estate, but you do have the ability to connect with others on different platforms. This is called crowdfunding. What it does is it allows you to invest in bigger commercial and residential deals through real estate developers. It requires you to invest capital, but not as much as what is required for a direct purchase. So you can imagine though, you know, because it is, uh, you are connecting, you're, you're basically connecting with others, you gotta be careful. You can invest in a single project, a portfolio, and you can have geographic diversification. You can invest in Florida, Georgia real estate out of New Mexico or Texas. Now, what's the con? The con is, is that they tend to be illiquid. Again, difficult to get your money out. And these are less regulated by the SEC. Um, they do boast higher returns. And so again, be cautious, be careful. But uh, whenever you get into a land development deal, uh, you just need to know what you're doing, read the terms, uh, and make sure you're, you're, if you don't know what you're doing, that you're getting coached appropriately. Okay, um, I wanted to take here as the last concept to talk about a self-directed IRA, um, specifically a Roth IRA. Folks will ask us uh, as they work with us, they'll say, hey, you know, am I obligated to stay within inside the confines of just market-based or stock ETFs, mutual funds? Um, within a Roth account? And the answer is no, you don't. In fact, that's one of the benefits of moving money uh, to a specific type of a Roth IRA called a self-directed IRA. So how does this work? If, how in the world do you take real estate and put that into a Roth account? Well, the way it works is that an IRA, you, you work with a custodian, you set up an agreement with a custodian, they then purchase for you the property directly into your Roth account. Once that property is purchased, the tenants that, that buy, you know, that pay rents pay directly into your Roth IRA account. How do they do that? Well, all that is being managed again by this custodian that, uh, that sets up this account for you. The profits are retained by the IRA by the Roth. In other words, they're not paying out to you every month, but rather it's being retained and held on to. Um, 
one of the downsides to this is that out of that retirement account, you use some of the proceeds to pay the expenses. So you're draining some of your retirement account, your Roth account to pay expenses should they arise. That's not viewed as a good thing. And But one of the positives is that you can have capital appreciation in this account. So not only is it generating income that's being held in that Roth account, but you have capital appreciation that you get to take advantage of. And keep in mind, Roth accounts are what? They are tax-free. All growth is tax-free. So this is something to take a look at. Now, they're more complex. They take a little bit more time. They have higher fees. So what I wanted to highlight a few considerations, if this is something that's interesting to you, for you to look at. It definitely takes a unique custodian. Oxford Wealth does not set up these types of accounts. Uh, you'll want to do some shopping on the local market and see who can do this for you. It doesn't have to be somebody there in your general area or vicinity. You can pick different custodians out of state if you want. But the reality is, is that they have to manage it for you. And many times it's housed within the confines of a trust. So they set that up for you, but it is by classification, a Roth IRA. There are no tax deductions with this kind of an account. You can imagine, if this is not a real estate deal like we just described. Uh, you, there are no tax benefits other than your, your investment grows tax-free into the future, but every year over year on your tax return, there are no deductions. Um, your expenses, I've already touched on that. They're paid by the, by the Roth account. Uh, borrowing is not easy. So you need to almost go in prepared to pay cash. That's the easiest way to do this. Some banks will not loan you money to put money into a self-directed Roth real estate account. So you need to just think about that, structure it properly, but paying cash is, is, uh, is the preferred route by, by many. And then lastly, the lack of liquidity. If you're, as you know, um, I'll often tell folks you can't eat real estate and it does not pay your short-term bills. And so if you need to flip and get out of that investment, you're obviously tied to the, the confines of the market. Um, imagine if you were in a Roth IRA real estate account back in 2008 when the market was on this, on this free fall um, and many people lost a significant amount of money in their home and in their investment properties. So there can be some significant risk in this account. There can also be some significant upside. Well, that's what I have for you guys. I, I hope this has been helpful. Let me turn here to the team. If anybody's got any questions, I am happy to stick around and ask and, and answer them for you. Um, we hope that everybody is doing well, has a great Memorial Day weekend. Uh, hang in there tough. The markets are, uh, they are gonna remain volatile. I don't see that changing. And um, I think uncertainty is gonna continue. So as a result of that, just be cautious, uh, be wise and uh, um, use and consider some of the strategies or alternatives that I mentioned earlier around uh, dollar cost averaging in the markets. And then if you're looking for something safe and guaranteed, if you're sitting on some cash, there are some options that are perhaps better than what banks might offer you. So with that guys, either throw a, a comment in the chat or uh, feel free to stick around here for a few if you would like to ask me a couple of questions. Otherwise we'll let everybody go. Guys, everybody have a great weekend. Thank you for, for tuning into our market update.